a little bit more about our ministry. All of these resources are free. We're not trying to sell anything tonight, but if you've got a fifth to 10th grader, you can go by tonight and pick up this book for free if you like, and just go to debunkevolution.com. We take all of the, uh, the, the life science and biology text uh, classroom information that's given on evolution, and we take the top 10 peer, uh, pillars of that and address it from a biblical standpoint. And if you have a high school or 11th grade or higher, please go to 7 and get them through this program before they go off to college. Really, really important grounding apologetics information there. Uh, our probably our most widely distributed book is this one. It's called The Answers to the Top 50 Questions about Genesis, Creation, and the Flood. Every year our ministry receives thousands of questions. We filter through them and we pick the top 50 questions that we get asked most frequently and wrote a book just on those top 50 questions so you can get that, um, that book at the table. And if you have a phone, of course, most people do, but you can download our, our mobile app for free. We have about 120,000 installations there. Just download that mobile app and it accesses most of our videos that are available on YouTube. And of course, a little bit about the movie, it's called The Ark and the Darkness. You can just go to noahsflood.com and sign up there. We have a growing mail list that will get out information and updates. And the book that you can get tonight called The Ark and the Darkness is also available on Amazon. And uh, we have currently the most watched movie uh, on YouTube about Noah's Flood right now. It's pushing about three million views. It came out about four years ago. We produced this movie by interviewing the leading experts around the world on geology and geophysics and paleontology about Noah's Flood and took the most credible evidence and smashed it into a 23 minute video. We put it up online and it went viral. It's got a lot of, a lot of views going on there. So if you want more drill down on what we're going to be coming, uh, covering tonight, just go to Noah's Flood and Catastrophic Plate Tectonics and you can see the long version of what we'll go through uh, tonight. So tonight is going to be a flip screen. Does anyone remember these books when, when you're a, a student? <clears throat> I literally have 120 slides to cover tonight, and we're going to do it all within an hour, and a lot of it is going to be just like that book. It's going to be flip screen, because when I would testify as an expert, we would build, in our case, what's called a mosaic of evidence. And a mosaic of evidence is when you take many different lines of reasoning from many different fields, put them all together to share a common story or a common theme. And that's what we'll be, uh, be looking at tonight. So when it comes to Genesis, there's a lot of different views. If you were to take a poll or a survey at this church, you'd have people that would fill up all these buckets. There's the idea of the gap theory or framework theory or progressive creation, the day age idea or old earth creationists. We stand up here, it's called the, the, the young earth position or a literal interpretation of Genesis. But I love my brothers and sisters that fill all of these other categories here. This church loves and welcomes people that are across all these different categories. And I love people that come from all these different categories. So if you come tonight and you're in this category or that category or wh whatever it might be, please just take this as my personal testimony. Jesus is the author and perfecter of your faith. So if Christ starts a good work in you, he's gonna carry it on through. So continue on that, that faith journey. And we certainly love you. We want your heart to connect with your head. What happened by way of my personal testimony is my heart belonged to Christ and I knew that. I was a spirit-filled Christian and rested under the authority of scripture. But my mind was back about 10 feet behind my heart with all kinds of questions. What about Neanderthals? What about saber-toothed cats? What about the dinosaurs? What about Noah's flood? Is Genesis mythology or is it real history book? And I didn't know how much those things were really anchoring and slowing down my faith. But when I took that hiatus about seven or eight years ago and drilled into the, the, the dinosaur fossil record and geology, looked into the same things we'll be covering tonight, it was like going to a chiropractor and the 18 inch bridge between my mind and my heart just got snapped into, into alignment. And it was like being born again, again. My mind could finally join my heart with all these questions I had. And it was like coming alive uh, again and my faith was, was renewed. So let's ask this question together tonight at a Bible conference. So the Bible, I would say, makes the biggest claim about a worldwide cataclysm of any religious text in history. It's the biggest claim of any religious book. 
and there's been tons and tons of ink spilled on this topic, including lots of ink spilled over the Bible. If you just take the Bible and look at, well, well, Moses, he wrote a whole lot about Noah's flood, about six chapters. Peter and Paul both wrote about Noah's flood. Jesus mentioned Noah's flood in Matthew 24 and referred it to it as a real, actual, historical event. And the Bible is filled with it, cross-referencing back and forth. These people quoted each other about the flood. They drew back and, and cross-referenced each other about the flood. So I would say that the credibility of the whole of Scripture depends on what I'm saying tonight being true. That's a bold claim. But, you know, if, if the Bible doesn't stand up to this level of scrutiny, I wouldn't stand here with my faith. I really have a, developed a skill of vetting evidence, and I have spent years pressure testing this idea of Noah's flood, and I am a 100% believer that it really happened tonight as we're going to go over it. Okay, so just by way of quick overview, uh, Genesis 6 to 9 is the three chapters that really covers the diary uh, from Noah about the flood. It was a 371 day process. Many people think, well, it only rained for 40 days and 40 nights. That's just the rain part. The Bible says that the fountains of the great deep were open for 150 days as Pangea was being broken apart. All the creatures were, were being buried in mud, sand, and ash. Uh, the pairs of land-dwelling, air-breathing animal kinds were saved. Not all the species, there's hundreds of thousands of species, but the animals were put on the ark after their kind, which is probably the family level on the biological chart of life there. Uh, it preceded the Ice Age. We don't have time tonight to go, in, go into the Ice Age, but it preceded the Ice Age. It's mentioned by several other Bible writers, and it was really a reset on world version number two. Um, 2 Peter 3 says the world that then was, was destroyed. And the world that's, that we're in now is going to be destroyed by fire. That's a summary of, of 2 Peter 3. So when was the flood? Well, if you hold to the Masoretic text, which is the main text that our Bibles are based on today, you can park Noah's flood between about 2348 B.C. and 2518 B.C. There's some differences there with how people treat Abraham's birth and lifespan. But if you hold to the Septuagint text, which is an additional scholarly body of text, it would put the flood back as far as 3168. But either way, holding to the authority of Scripture, you pretty much have to bracket Noah's flood between, uh, between these time dates. So between about four and a half thousand years and five thousand some, some years ago. But that's when it happened according to the Bible. How long was the flood itself? 371 days. The waters increased and prevailed upon the earth for 150 days. Then the waters decreased for 150 days. And then earth dried out for 70 days. So if you read uh, Genesis 6 through 9, you have a very long a historical account of how long the flood happened. And there's all kinds of great details given in that 371 day account. So the first thing I looked at about Noah's flood is if it really happened, I would expect there not just to be some flood myths and flood legends, but hundreds and hundreds of them. And that's exactly what we found. Some of the main flood myths are things like the Enuma Elish, Atrahasis, the Samaritan King's List, the Gilgamesh account, the Simmons Ark tablet, and the Iridu tablet. These findings, all these, uh, these clay tablets were found right where we would expect to find them in the ancient Near East, right where uh, Eridu was, which is where the Tower of Babel was most likely located. So the, the ark lands right here, and then we have all these ancient clay tablets emerging and spreading around as the story of the ark echoes throughout all of history. So that's what some of these old clay tablets look like, but I, we believe they all originate back from God's word as the real account. So one of the interesting things, if you go back and look at all these different flood myths, is they have some elements that are in common. For example, m most of the major flood myths have these eight things in common. There was a punishment uh, that was going to be sent by God or the gods. There was one chosen person to bring all the animals and, and, uh, and his family onto an ark. The animals were saved. There was a vessel given with specifications, like even the Ark of Gilgamesh has specifications that was given. They survive the flood, birds are deployed to go find dry land, and there's a sacrifice to God or gods afterwards. If you take all these ancient flood myths, there's some common themes that are threads throughout all of them 
that interestingly all go back and really confirm the Bible as the original credible account. So I want to show a quick video next that talks about the difference between truth and myth. Many myths are based on historical accounts, but they get embellished over time, becoming more and more mythical as the story is repeated over generations. This is exactly what we see with flood myths like Gilgamesh. They take the original historical account, the biblical flood, and grow it into a mythical, interesting story. So isn't that interesting that if you take the lead flood myth, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the epic says that, that this guy Gilgamesh built the ark in seven days. It was 200 feet square, which would obviously topple around. It had seven stories to it. It was only in the flood for a week. The, the Bible or the epic of Gilgamesh says it was a worldwide flood, and it was obviously not seaworthy. Noah's ark took 55 to 75 years to build, was 515 feet long, lasted in the flood 371 days, and was definitely seaworthy. This is where we believe the Tower of Babel was, the, the area right here, the flood, the air, mountains of Ararat were over here, but all of these dots that you see are flood myths and legends that are worldwide. There's not dozens, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, including the Native Americans, are filled and filled and filled with their ancient oral histories about this ancient guy that survived the flood and landed on the top of the mountain in a canoe. They have their own versions of it. But this guy, Nick, has done uh, studies and studies of it. I'll show you his book next. But what's, what's interesting is that the closer we get to where the flood actually happened, it's like a radar beam, the more and more accurate the details get. By the time the flood mist gets way over here, sometimes it's embellished and the, you, know, you don't have the birds flying around looking for land anymore and it gets a little bit, the echo of it gets more and more faint. But the six clay tablets that we have about the actual flood have those eight main elements in common. So the closer you get to where the flood really happened, where the, where the ark landed, the more and more the details align with the actual truth from the Bible. And uh, this guy, Nick, is the one that came out with the book. He, he spent years of his life going around studying all these different flood myths, and he's got 300 of them just from North and South America alone. Isn't that amazing? And I think when you read through these flood myths, probably about 200 of them seem like they're far-pitched fantasies. But about 100 of them, you read and read again, and you're like, oh my gosh, how did the Sioux tribe have all these flood details that they had no con connection at all to Noah? But somehow they carried that story down for hundreds and hundreds of years, lots of different generations, and they've got these myths and legends that have an uncanny overlap with the real, actual biblical flood. But that's a great book to get. It's called Echoes of Ararat. And uh, okay, so now let's look at the actual mechanics and some of the physics behind the ark itself. Because I'll, I'll stand up here and say that I think the ark and its dimensions and its shape and its size and with covered with pitch and the dimensions and all that stuff is probably the only dimension possible that could have made a seaworthy ship to go out and last you know 371 days through the flood process and I'll, you'll see some of the reasons next as we get into this this guy in 1993 dr shion went to the korean naval center and built 12 different models of Noah's Ark and, one, and went to test them with respect to three characteristics, the stability, the strength, and the comfort, and determined that the biblical dimensions of the 300 cubits by 50 by, by, by 30 were the most accurate ones to making the, a, a, an ideal ship that would have the best comfort, the most strength, and the most Stability. So that's rectangular shape with a seven to one length to width ratio is actually perfect for an ocean faring barge. Now this guy Chuck uh, threw some hydraulics into him, some hydraulics and some physics. It's about a one minute clip. Let's see what he has to say. These interesting dimensions, whether cubits or feet doesn't matter. We know that it's 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits deep and let's assume it's carrying weight that lets, lets it have about a, let's say a 15 cubit uh, draft, okay? Now, of course, its weight is concentrated in its center of gravity, which would be in the middle. It has a weight coming down and it's got a buoyancy that's going up that's equal. Follow me, that's why it sits in the water, it's balanced and it's equilibrium. Let's assume it tips over to, to prep from wind or waves and so forth. Gravity is pulling down through its center of gravity, but the 
water that is displaced is pushing up at it in as its, its buoyancy. But you'll notice that it's going gonna, it's gonna to have the center of buoyancy will be at the centroid of a triangle. If I, if I knock it over about 30 degrees, center of a triangle, at the centroid of the triangle is offset from the gravity. So this forms a couple tending to straighten it out. You follow me? Because the upward pressure is attempting to move it counterclockwise in the diagram. You follow me? So, and they're equal, of course, but that's what's called a couple. It's a moment. And uh, it turns out this particular design, uh, as long as the center of the, the vector of buoyancy is above the center of gravity, it's stable. It'll right itself. In this particular design, it can virtually go almost to 90 degrees without tipping over. It's incredibly stable proportions. It's, it's no surprise, of course, that God knew what he was doing. And so... <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Imagine being Noah and God comes and says, hey, build a ship out of gopher wood. We, no one knows what gopher wood is, but that's what the Bible talks about. It might have been some light wood light, like spruce. Build it out of, out of gopher wood, put it three stories in it. It's got to be 300 cubits by 50 by 30 and cover it with pitch, which is like melted pine tar, both on the inside and the outside. I've done that before. When you take pitch and melt it, pine sap, and melt it onto the backing like of, of ship lapping, it melts like fiberglass and it really adds to the resiliency of the ship as well as does a, a great job waterproofing. So amazing, amazing design. We actually hired a team of hydrophysicists or hydro hydraulic experts and said, hey, we want you guys to take the Epic of Gilgamesh against the biblical Ark and test them to see which one was, uh, was going to be seaworthy. So they build it, they, they put it through this scale called the Beaufort Storm Scale that goes from zero to 12. You've got hurricane forces and violent storms and storms over here. It's just a scale that measures storms and we'll see how uh, the Noah's Ark did against the Epic of Gilgamesh. How would something like this fare during a catastrophic worldwide flood? It would obviously tumble, killing or maiming its passengers. That's obviously quite different than the biblical ark, which had a 7 to 1 length to width ratio, which is very similar to many of today's ocean barges, making a feasible design for staying afloat. Very fascinating. So 7 to 1 length width ratio is very similar to all those big ships, the container ships you see coming into Long Beach. So there was a pre-flood world. We're going to go through this really, really quickly, but the Bible talks about the world that then was being over flood with water or perish. I think the dinosaur fossil record gives us a really good idea what that world used to look like before the flood. We have people publishing books like Out of Thin Air that talk about an ancient past that had different oxygen layers or different barometric pressures probably than the world that we have today does. You've got big creatures like these sauropods that would probably have a hard time breathing and getting enough oxygen in today's earth atmosphere. And pterosaurs with the 53 foot wingspan could not likely fly in today's earth atmosphere. And then you've got these things like t uh, these huge dragonflies that have two and a half foot wings. We find these in the fossil record, probably couldn't flap around and fly in today's earth atmosphere. We had things like giant fungi, these 20 foot tall mushrooms that probably look like like that, we have that in the fossil record. There's eight foot long centipedes. How'd you like to find that in your bed at night? So, uh, and even uh, evolutionists are perplexed saying, we don't know, we can't figure out how you can take an 80 ton Apatosaurus and feed it with enough oxygen in today's Earth's atmosphere because its nasal passages are only twice the size of a modern day horse. So how in the world can you take that much muscle and that much veins and feed it with enough oxygen so it doesn't fall over and faint? Well, maybe the pre-flood world had higher oxygen or different oxygen or different pressures. Same thing with these huge pterosaurs. You'd have to, this, the flight physics studies on these pterosaurs say you have to hit it with 16 mile an hour winds just to get its toes up off of the ground. So we couldn't take off in today's Earth atmosphere. It's a 600 pound reptile with bat light wings. It could go out as the longest one they found, 53 feet. So I would argue that there was a world before the flood that was different than the world that we have today. And that world was cataclysmically buried. So how do you get all the animals in the ark? Well, we get this, this challenge a lot. People say, well, you can't stuff hundreds of thousands of species or tens of thousands of species. Actually, the barominologists that have studied this, which is the, the study of the original animal kind, has said that all you need is about 7,000 animals on the ark to reproduce all the different species that we have today. Here's an example. If you look at Canis lupus, the, the wolf, 
Well, the wolf is capable of, of generating 339 dog breeds. Inside of his DNA, you can breed basset hounds and chihuahuas and all that stuff. Now, you can't go back from a basset hound to a wolf, but if that's the original dog kind, a lot of the breeds could come from the wolf, all the different breeds we have today. Same thing with horses. 336 breeds of horses, and they're all today interfertile. You can take a little tiny horse and a huge Clydesdale, they're still interfertile. They might look kind of funny, but they're still <laughs> interfertile. Um, the bear family, at the Ursidae bear family, there's eight different species, five are still interfertile, and you've got 68 breeds of chickens all going back to one kind. So when you collapse back the animal tree like that, you can go from thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of different creatures and species and pair it back to just a set of 7,000 animal varieties that can go on the, on the ark. So that, that tree just collapses really, really quickly. So in the beginning, God creates all these animals after their kind. They probably speciate and vary a little bit by their region and by their environment. Then we have a flood event. And then after the flood, they get back off the ark and then start varying and speciating and adapting for their environments. But then we have lots of extinctions that happen after the flood as well. So some animals continued and varied, but a lot of the other animals like the dinosaurs just went extinct. So now let's talk about my favorite part and some challenging parts too. We're gonna to get into the flood mechanics. And the question I want you to keep in mind for this section is, is just this. Ask yourself the question that plagued me for months. Why in the world are all these dinosaurs that take up a 14 state area in the middle of America, why are they buried in heaps of ash, mud, and sand? If you talk to any paleontologist that's got a lot of experience out in the field, they'll say, yeah, dinosaurs are buried in three different products, mud, sand, and ash. And oftentimes they're buried under 100 feet of mud, sand, and ash. What in the world could produce that? What in the world is gonna produce that volume of ash and mud and sand to bury dinosaurs over a 14 state region in the middle of America that goes all the way to Canada and all the way down to Mexico, 1,800 miles long? I think it's Noah's flood. So just remember this acronym, uh, HAMS, heaps of ash, mud, and sand. So when you go to college class or high school or whatever, just remember the acronym HAMS, heaps of ash, mud, and sand. So here's the 14 state region. It's three partial countries over a million square miles, encompassing over 14 states. Every dot that you see here is not just one dinosaur, not a dozen, but either hundreds or thousands of dinosaurs that are found buried. Each one of these is a massive fossil graveyard or fossil find. So all these dots represent the collections of dinosaur bones that have been found in, the, in that region. So they're scattered all over America here, but the main area is right in the middle of America. It's almost like something happened in the middle of America to, stake, to take millions and millions of dinosaurs and bury them under heaps and heaps and heaps, sometimes 50, 100, 150 feet tall of mud, sand, and ash. So we'll show you some of the mechanisms that we think are responsible. The other clue that you'll find is these are all the different dinosaur varieties that we can find in the Jurassic layers. Why in the world did they all die off? They're all gone and they're buried in the similar regions. Similar species are found in similar regions. As if there was a herd of triceratops in one area and boom, they're gone, they're buried. There's a herd of sauropods over here and all of a sudden they're all gone. They're not scattered randomly all over America. We find them clustered in groups, oftentimes by species. So here's what some of these layers look like. This is the Morrison Formation. We have the Jurassic layers here, which went first in the flood, followed by the Cretaceous layers. <clears throat> these are all dinosaur-bearing fossil layers. Here's another uh, clip of what it looks like. That's the Dinosaur National Monument. Look how thick these layers are. You can see they, they take measurements of them. They take the earth here and, cu and cut it out in these cross-sectional cuts, and they're filled and filled, filled with mud, sand, and ash, and it goes hundreds of feet or sometimes thousands of feet, what could do that? What could take these creatures and bury them in hundreds and hundreds of feet of mud, sand, and ash? Here's a couple of cars next to these huge dinosaur bearing uh, mountains here. Heaps and heaps of mud, sand, and ash. Look at this, here's another huge mountain side here. You can see with all these stratified layers, we believe are laid down by flood tsunamis that come up inland and then they retreat backwards, leaving all the dinosaurs behind. 
But here's another clue. This is bentonite, which is ash. All this black stuff that you see on top is volumes upon volumes of ash. Where did all that ash come from? And why don't we see things happening today that's producing volumes and volumes of ash? But look at that amount of ash, just tons and tons of it. And this is all eroded, but you can see these dinosaur layers here. They're all cut through with these cross sections. But this is a type of terrain that we find dinosaur creatures in. That's in the Hell Creek Formation up in Montana. Here's another cross section just to give you an idea. There's a scale goes from 200 feet to 1,000 feet. Some of, these, some of these layers here are hundreds and hundreds of feet deep. What on earth could bring all that mud, sand, and ash up to the middle of America? And why are, don't we see these level of layers right now being deposited in America? Here's the Mississippi River Delta, and it's got lots of sediment, and it comes and fans out. Why don't we see dinosaurs in those layers? because no big cataclysmic flood is bringing them there today. We have all kinds of Mississippi Delta uh, River fans that, that are going out, all these sediment layers. You can't find dinosaur bones in them. So what happens that's unique with the, the dinosaur uh, uh, deposits in the middle of America is you see these stratified layers that were laid down by tsunamis and you find millions and millions of dinosaurs buried in them, but nothing's happening today that would produce the same type of process. We only see that with the with the dead dinosaurs. So here's some key flood verses that's gonna really unpack the secret of how we can figure this out. Genesis 7:11 is probably the most telling verse in the Bible about Noah's flood. It says in the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, already does that sound like a history book or a myth book? You're being real specific with this. In the second month and the 17th day of the month, the same day, we're all of the fountains of the great deep broken up. Right there, stop the show, something happened on the ocean floor that started the flood. Very interesting, God says, not just some, but all of the fountains of the great deep. The Hebrew word there is bakah, and it has the idea of someone cleaving earth open and bringing all these fountains from the, gate, the great deep, bringing them up, and then the, the water started on the ocean floor, and then it covered the entire earth, 15 cubits upward, which is about 22 feet. The waters did prevail, and the mountains were covered. So something started on the, on the, on the ocean floor, and it lasted for 150 days. What was that? We'll, uh, we'll go through that next year. These six guys in the 1990s figured it out. They're all geologists and geophysicists. We've interviewed all of these guys about Noah's flood, and they came up with a theory in the 1990s called catastrophic plate tectonics. This article's later, but they started the theory back in the 90s called CPT, catastrophic plate tectonics. Our whole movie is gonna unpack that, um, that theory from a really good visual standpoint. But that's the theory that they came up with. And John Bumgardner, the guy in the middle there, said here's what it probably looked like. You've got the fountains of the Great Deep, which is underwater rifting happening on the ocean floor, bursting up critically heated fan jets that are literally split around, around the Earth, sending up tsunami after tsunami onto the Earth, burying these dinosaur creatures off all over North America, and pan, a Pangea-like formation began splitting apart. Before the flood, you had one big continental configuration. Some people call it Gondwana or Rodinia or Pangaea. The continents were pushed together, but we can go back today and see where the fountains of the Great Deep still are. Even in the middle of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we have a 10,000 mile tear right here in the middle of the world. And we can spin the globe around and that the, these rift systems go around the globe for over 40,000 miles around the Earth and they cover it 1.6 times over. We believe these were the fountains of the Great Deep that were catastrophically involved in pushing out all the mud, sand, and ash and making sure these dinosaur creatures got buried. When you take a bathymetric map, which is a map where you take off all the water, you can see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Look how peaked it, it is with all these perpendicular stretch cuts, like stretch marks over here. This is what split apart and it pushed the continents apart, leaving these shelves over here. And we know the continents perfectly can fit back together. But what's really interesting is we find dead hadrosaurs over here and we find their sisters and cousins over here. Very interesting, currently a couple thousand miles split apart, but if you look at the fossils over here, they match the fossils over here. 
So there was an ecosystem that was living when these two pieces were together. When it split apart, it buried them in mud over here and in mud over here. We'll look at that more specifically in just a minute. But here's what it looks like. We've got the seafloor spreading. We've, we've got hot magma coming up from the bottom of the earth here. It's forming new seafloor. The new seafloor forms quickly and spreads apart and it pushes the continents about at a sprint, about five miles per hour is what they believe is how fast the continents were being pushed apart during the flood. So we have, when the new seafloor is spreading, it goes over here and hits the land continents, builds up tension and dives underneath it. So new seafloor being created comes up over here and hits like California, for example, and dives down. And when it dives down, it creates a lot of offshore volcanism right over here that's coming up through the, through the land continent again. So, but when the seafloor spreads, it comes over here, hits the land, and it's gonna build tension. This is exactly what happened in Haiti. It happened in Japan. In Japan, there was a 60-foot seafloor slip that resulted in the big tsunamis that came up over Japan. That's exactly the subduction-related events is responsible for the tsunamis. And during the flood, there was those, those were happening every few minutes in cycles, coming up, washing over the land, retreating, building again, coming up, washing over the land, and retreating. We know this happened because we see the subducted plate today. You can use un underground uh, radars and see the Farallon plate subducted in the heat, the heat map, according to the scientists that have studied this say, yeah, that's uh, the cold stuff is down here and then it gets you know, warmer as you go up or more recent as you go up. But the Farallon plate subducted underneath the North American continent responsible for all of these, uh, these tsunamis. So here's another question. Dinosaurs are buried in thousands of cubic miles of ash that spread across multiple states. Where could such immense volumes of ash come from? What system produced it? And why are the dinosaurs buried in it? Here's a quick video that will explain that. These rapidly subducting plates resulted in enormous volcanism that spewed megatons of ash that entombed countless dinosaurs in multiple states. The evidence for this is obvious. For example, the Independence Dyke Swarm is a system of linear fissures that erupted during the flood. This system extends over 370 miles in Southern California and belted out 4,000 cubic miles of ash that covered multiple states, leaving behind enormous ash deposits like the Brushy Basin Member, which is 110 meters thick in eastern Utah and found in 35 other locations around the region. These ash beds are mixed with sand. Sanic upheaval was happening at the same time. The case for the biblical flood grows even stronger when looking at how the strength of the volcanic systems and extent of the ash deposits declined after the flood. Truly, the rapidly subducting oceanic plates created the Independence Dyke Swarm during the flood, depositing 4,000 cubic miles of ash. This was followed by a couple of major Yellowstone eruptions after the flood that deposited 600 and then 240 cubic miles of ash. This was later followed by the Long Valley eruption that produced 150 cubic miles of ash, then the Crater Lake eruption with only 17 cubic miles of ash, and finally the Mount St. Helens eruption, which deposited only one quarter cubic mile of ash. So if you were going to go to ask right now secular geologists and say, tell me about the Independence Dyke Swarm that's in Los Angeles, they would say, well, it's a 375 linear fissure, like a volcano system. And sometime in the ancient past, it blew up 4,000 cubic miles of ash and spread it all over America. We think that happened during Noah's flood, burying all these creatures. So we see it, we have the same evidence. We just have different timelines and different explan explanations on why it happens. But that's how basically half of America got filled with ash. It was because the plates were subducting quickly, which caused this volcanism, which produced all the ash. It happened in a year, year time frame. We know this happened because we still have all these subducted uh, plates around the ring of fire. And as of subducting, 90% of Earth's earthquakes are responsible or caused by the plates that are still subducting only slower because, of course, we're way after Noah's flood. But 90% of the earthquakes today happen still because these plates are still diving underneath the land continents. So here again, that's why we get 14 states of dead dinosaurs in the middle of America with an 1,800 you know, mile swath, a thousand miles wide, a million square miles, something huge and catastrophic is responsible for that. Well, what about the, the, the world would say, well, it was just an asteroid, the Chicxulub asteroid, 
uh, that landed in the Yucatan Peninsula, way down there off of Mexico. So that's, that's their explanation currently, although there's a large growing group of hundreds of dissenting geologists that no longer believe in the Chicxulub asteroid. There's a, a gal, a geologist from Princeton University that's leading a parade of hundreds of geologists away from this theory. Yet when every, every single museum you go to, you'll hear the dinosaurs went extinct because of a big asteroid. Well, let's test the asteroid theory. How in the world could it bury, this is the biggest T-Rex they ever found under all that mud. So there's where all these T-Rexes are found over here. Here's where the asteroid would have hit. Here's all the dead dinosaurs over here. This is a simulation of the Chicxulub asteroid. So it lands way down here in Mexico and it comes up here and brings tidal waves just meters high and covers over Texas at the most. Well, how in the world can you explain all these dead dinosaurs way up here that are not buried in just a few meters of water or mud, sand and ash. They're buried under 100 feet, 200 feet of mud and they're way, way, way up here. It seems to me that something like the subducting plates causing the tsunamis coming up and washing over America like this in succession as you've got the new seafloor being formed, hits California, dives under, causes all that volcanism and everything, and it's causing these tsunamis to come up in repeating fashion, burying the dinosaurs. So something happened that came from the east and went to the west and buried up all of these dinosaurs in huge, huge volumes. Uh, Here's one that's called the Tanis uh, fossil bed. They just found this a few years ago. It kind of went crazy in the paleontology literature. Let's watch a short video of what they found here in, uh, in North Dakota. In 2019, the discovery of the Tanis fossil bed in North Dakota was announced, a discovery that many paleontologists are calling the find of the century. This two-acre fossil bed is a snapshot of what North America looked like at the peak of the Genesis flood. This site is full of fossils, many in upright rather than flat positions, including trees, plants, and saltwater mosasaurs mixed with thousands of complete freshwater paddlefish and sturgeons. The pristine condition of the fossils suggests that they were covered almost immediately after death. They also found broken remains from almost all known dinosaur categories in the area, including eggs and hatchlings, and a triceratops hip complete with tissue impressions, indicating a rapid death and burial. Even the evolutionary scientists admit this bone bed was caused by a flood. Their research paper well established that this site was the result of at least two successive tsunamis, evidenced by the combination of land and marine creatures mixed together, the 3D condition of the fossils, and the various age groups within each species, indicating a complete snapshot in time. The fossil fish also had clear signs of tetany, a condition indicating sudden death due to poisoning, asphyxiation, and choking. They're also clear that at least two major tsunamis occurred one right after the other, proven by rapid sedimentation and a 100-degree change in flow direction, indicating inundation and backflow phases. Isn't that fascinating? So they found representatives of every dinosaur species in that area killed, buried with freshwater fish, all mixed up together, and two tsunamis that came up, retreat, came up, and retreat. Fascinating. It fits the theory that we're talking about tonight almost perfectly. So here we have, we have the, the study of dinosaur taphonomy is, is the study of how these dinosaur dies and died and we find them in mud, sand, and ash and we have great explanations for how it happened. We've got the subducting plates. They're going to bring up tons of sand and mud and then as they're going down, they're, they're diving down with the, uh, with the, 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 the uh, seafloor is going underneath like this and we have the huge volcanic activity that's coming up, pushing up all this ash and that's we, why we find them buried in those three different products. So here's another thing to think about. So if there wasn't a worldwide flood that lasted about a year, we wouldn't expect all the dinosaur species to be buried together in the same regions. We wouldn't expect that all various species to have died all at once in the same layers but that's what we find. There's all the Hadrosaur family. Here's all the Allosaurus. Look at all these little circles here. What in the world are they doing kind of bunched up together when they're getting you know, covered over by, by Noah's flood here? There's all the sauropods and here's all the Stegosaurus. Same regions. Look what happens when we fly in all the fossil records for all three of these creatures. 
they're buried in very much the same regions. So if this happened over millions of years slowly, if evolution is just, just going on and on, then why do we see a snapshot in time of all these creatures buried in mud, sand, and ash, and we've got the Chicxulub asteroid 2,000 miles south from here. There's no way you could bury them in 50 feet of mud, sand, and ash, and they're living in the same regions when, they're, when their fossils are buried in mud, sand, and ash. We talked a little bit about this, about the idea of fossil correlation. This is very, very convincing evidence. So fossil correlation, this is just a, a, a picture from a modern textbook today. They say, well, look, we even have some fossils of different species that we can find in four different continents today. And so evolutionists will even say, yeah, we believe the continents were pushed together. And sometimes you find the species across two continents or maybe three or maybe four. We agree with this. So if you take each one of these dots, it's a big, massive fossil bed. Sometimes they're massive graveyards of fossils. And if you take this notch over here and you put it into to that notch, we know that there used to be an ecosystem there, a nice little environment where these creatures were living in this area. And almost all of a sudden, the fountains of the great deep break open. And these creatures, here's the key, they're found buried in the mud that was responsible for killing them. And we find them on both sides, so if you do, you do a fossil count, look at the insects here, the bivalves, the different types of trees and everything, there's a credible correlation here between the, cre the creatures and the, uh, the plants we find over here compared to over here. They were once together and then they got rapidly split apart. Great, great evidence of Noah's flood. The other thing we find about the dinosaur fossil record is why in the world are they buried furiously and they're disarticulated? You know that only 3% of the dinosaur fossil record, we find these big complete skeletons and complete T-Rexes. 97% of the fossil record is scrambled and disarticulated. We find dinosaurs in these death poses where they're choking on mud as they died. Surprisingly, people have actually tested this theory by burying chickens alive, which is, go, go test the ethics of that one, but uh, <laughs> don't find me doing it. But, um, but anyhow, and they find that as these chickens die, because they have necks that are, are similar here, that as they're getting asphyxiated, they're sucking for air, their necks arch back, and that's how they die. That's the death pose. Why do we find all these dinosaurs dead, choking on mud as they died? Very, very interesting. Theropods you typically find in that type of a position. Here's a huge T-Rex, same thing. He's choking on mud as he's dying, and we find him in the same, we find him in the mud that was responsible for killing him. And here's Dinosaur Provincial Park. I went up there as far as the eye can see. In fact, there's one place you can see for 14 miles. And as far as your eye can see, for 14 miles, there's dead, buried centros centrosaurs, these huge triceratops types of creatures. And they're buried with fish and turtles and mammals and amphibians. Well, you know, wait a second, I, I thought dinosaurs were supposed to evolve into mammals or into birds, but they find birds buried with dinosaurs. In fact, you guys have all heard the story about dinosaurs supposedly evolving into birds. You know, they found 120 bird species buried with dinosaurs and dinosaur layers, cormorants, owls, penguins, all kinds of creatures or, or of, of uh, birds are buried with dinosaurs. So we have good evidence that the flood happened quickly. Look at all these clips here from museum signs um, all around America. Hundreds of dinosaurs died in and were buried in a flash flood. That's from a secular museum. Giant trees stripped and quickly buried by an ancient flood. A large ancient flood washing over the starfish all at once, entombing them. Hundreds of dinosaurs being together with shark teeth. Well, how do you mix marine life and terrestrial life together? You need a big, huge flood. For, for doing that. This is really interesting though. That this is one of the most intriguing evidences that we found. This is Jack Horner. He's a, a leading secular uh, a paleontologist. Wrote this book called Digging Dinosaurs, but it's subtitled The Search That Unraveled the Mystery of the Baby Dinosaurs. So what is the mystery of the baby dinosaurs? Look what he found. He says, we, he, we had found one huge bed of myasaurus bones stretching 1.25 miles east to west there were up to 30 million fossil fragments in that area. We had discovered the tomb of 10,000 dinosaurs. So think about this. He discovers a fossil bed. It stretches a mile long, and it's got 10,000 dinosaurs buried in it. What's unique about it? No babies, not a single one. Um, he also says, we, how could any mudslide, no matter how catastrophic, 
have the force to, to take a two to three ton animal that had just died and smash it around so that its femur, still embedded in the flesh of its thigh, split lengthwise. So this herd stretched over a mile of 10,000 dinosaurs were rapidly buried and they found no youth. They found 10,000 adults. All of them were nine to 23 feet long, no youth, no babies. What could create a situation like that where you get 10,000 dinosaurs in a panic, a whole herd of them splitting, leaving all the kids behind and we find them buried together. The only thing I could do that would be a stampede. The dinosaurs are like, we're out of here. Leave the nest behind, let's book it. And they're all buried together over a one mile stretch, 10,000 adults, no kids. The smallest one was only nine feet. Here's the biggest condition, uh, uh, you know, one of the biggest uh, proofs and evidences for me, and we'll close with this tonight, fossils. When you go around to, to museums, they say, well, these fossils are basically, they used to be bone, but now they're hardened rock. You can go in and look at the museums and they'll say, well, minerals in the ground or groundwater surrounding the skeleton slowly replace the bone and form it into a fossil. So when I was a kid growing up and going to school, it was beat into my head by all the professors, hey, fossils are just, are, are, are just hardened rocks nowadays. They're not actual bone. That's not what they're finding out nowadays. Over the last 20 years, we're finding that they're actually still bone. So this is what the museums say. While this was happening, the water seeped into the bones, leaving behind minerals, turning the bones into stone. But he, if that's true, the look at the discovery that has happened here. Since the 1950s, there's been 120 peer-reviewed science journals that have established 16 different types of bioorganic materials that are found in dinosaur bones. 16 different types. Red blood cells, red blood vessels, uh, collagen, fex, histones, proteins, osteocytes, bone cells, all this stuff is still in dinosaur bones. They're cutting these dinosaur bones open and finding soft tissue inside. And these 120 peer-reviewed journals are not creationist publications. These are science journals where it's people who don't believe in creation. Here's a list of them. Uh, Brian Thomas has got his PhD in, in paleobiochemistry is compiling this, 120 peer-reviewed science journals all admit now we're finding fresh stuff in bones that should not be, be there, should not be present and because these bones are supposedly millions of years old. But we're finding things like this. You take a triceratops horn and demineralize it and you can still stretch it. It's pliable, soft tissue. It's not rock, it's bone. And when you demineralize it, take the hard calcification off, it's still pliable and stretchable. How in the world could that bone be 65 million years old? It seems more to me like it was buried in a flood about four and a half thousand years ago and it's still fresh enough to pull and twist and, and pry. They're finding red blood cells lined up in blood vessels still intact. How in the world could that be millions of years old? This guy, he's a, the founder and director of the largest dinosaur museum in the world, the Royal Terrell Museum. And he says, yeah, usually most of the original bone is still present in a dinosaur fossil. So uh, here's one that even admits a hydrosaur toe bone. And it says it's still in its original bone and it's not rock. And we'll close with just a couple more slides here. We'll leave it on this one. This is collagen, which has a known half-life. Most scientists will say collagen can only last between 10,000 years and 30,000 years because collagen is what, what makes up bones and makes them flexible. So bones are a, a mixture of hydroxyapatite, which is the hard mineral side of the bone, and collagen, which makes it soft and flexible. So it kind of puts the two things together to make it pliable. So this collagen, if you take a chicken leg and throw it out in mud, the collagen should start decaying because it's a bioorganic material. They're still finding this in dinosaur bones and five scientific studies that are peer reviewed are finding that this collagen is organic to the creature that they're finding it in. It's not contamination, it's real collagen, it's still in dinosaur bones, but there's not a scientist around now that will say it can last more than 900,000 years. It's the most, the longest maximum life they'll give it, but they're finding this collagen in dinosaur bones. So how in the world, if collagen should all be gone in less than a million years, why do they find it in dinosaur bones that are supposedly 65 million years old? So that doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to make much sense. So I would say, are these dinosaur bones with these 16 different types of bioorganic materials, are they 65 million years old or did they get buried rapidly in a flood about 44 to 4,500 years ago? 
Interestingly, the last two things that they just discovered in the last couple of years is dinosaur cartilage and nerve cells in dinosaur bones. Isn't that amazing? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and end there just so I can take maybe one or two questions before we close. Oh, let me just skip through these. Dinosaur mummies, look at that. That you can still see pig, uh, skin pigments, ligaments, tendons still, still there. They just found this one. Mummified uh, dinosaurs. They still found inside of this gullet what this creature was eating. They've got magnolia ferns inside of its throat that they still found. So that certainly can't be uh, 65 million years old. I know that was a race tour, guys. Hopefully I delivered on my tour to give you a flip book of a good mosaic of evidence. If you want the slowed down version, read this book because a lot of the evidence is still in there. But let me see if I can just take maybe one or two questions before we, we close up.